Hello everyone! Welcome back to another lecture of Bio 101. If you're not from my class, hello, my name is Kavathari, nice to meet you. And if you're from my class, hello, it's me. So in the last lecture video, Sir Roms talked about the measures of central tendency and location. Specifically, he discussed about the mean, the mode, and the median. So if you haven't watched that lecture, please head on over to that video first because I will be using some of the concepts there in this lecture. But if you have watched that video, please stay right here. Uh, as you can already guess from the title for this lesson, we will be talking about variability and the measures of dis dispersion of data around the mean. But before we proceed to the actual lesson, let's first consider this scenario. So suppose we have two brands of matches, brand A and brand B. Our trusted brand A claims that, on average, each box contains 48 matchsticks. On the other hand, brand B also claims that their bo boxes contain 48 matchsticks on average. Being the ever-curious explorer you are, you tested both of these claims and obtained these results. So for brand A, you, uh, you got 48, 49, 49, 47, 48, and 49 sticks for each box. So uh, you calculated the mean, and just like what's written on the box, they contain 48 matchsticks per box on average. Now you do, uh, you do the same for the second brand, and you were surprised by the results you got. So you have 12 sticks in one box, 62 on the second, 3 on the third, 50 on the fourth, 93 on the fifth, and 68 on the sixth. How absurd, right? So you notice that all of them were far from their claim of 48 matchsticks per box. But when you calculated the mean, surprisingly, exactly as they claim, the boxes contain 48 matchsticks per box. So you have proven that both of, both, both of them are true to their claims, but which brand do you think is better? So pause the video if you need time to think about it. But if you're a normal person, obviously you'd pick brand A. Why is this so? So probably your reasoning is that they're more consistent, um, the brand is more reliable, their claims are more reliable, and compared to brand B, the, um, the number of matchsticks per box of brand A is less varied or less variable. So really what I'm trying to point out is that um, although data sets have the same average, they can still be entirely different. This is why, although measures of central tendency are good tools to describe your data, more often they are not adequate since they don't give us any idea how frequently values that are close to it will be encountered in the data. Thus, to give a better description of our data, one needs to know the extent of the variability or dispersion of their data points to make sense of the mean value. So take note, we'll use the words variability and dispersion interchangeably in this lecture. So the concept of variation is especially important in biology where variation is inevitable. One obvious example is our height. So people will always vary in height. Um, and another example is the weight of the fruits in the same tree. So it would be quite impossible that the fruits will have the same exact weight. There will also be variations in the number of insects from plant to plant. Um, flowers will not always bloom on the same day and so on. And actually, if data sets were all the same, there will be no need to do statistical analysis in the first place. So the concept of variability is really central to statistics. So because of these uh, intrinsic variations in our measurements, whenever we report our distribution or our data, it's always useful to have an idea of the measure of dispersion or variability. So this measures of dispersion or variability is an indication of the spread of measurements around the center of the distribution. Measurements that are more concentrated around the center of of distribution have low variability or low dispersion, whereas data that are more spread out along the measurement scale have high variability or high dispersion. So the five common measures of dispersion, or also known as summaries of variation, are the range, the mean deviation, the variance, the standard deviation, and the coefficient of variation. There are more measures of dispersion, but we'll only discuss these five in this lecture. But feel free to read about the others if you're so interested. So starting with the range, this is the simplest way to describe variation. The range is defined as a difference between the largest and the smallest observation in the data. 
So if we have this sample problem, so I'll read it to you. The IQs of five members of a certain family are 108, 112, 127, 116, and 113. Find the range. So again, the formula for range is maximum measurement minus the minimum measurement. So we see that our highest measurement is 127 and our lowest measurement is 108. So taking the difference between these two, we get 19 as the range of the data set. Okay. Take note also that the range has the same unit as your original observation. It just so happens that in this example, IQ levels don't really have units, so we don't see uh, you, we don't see a unit for the range as well. Okay. So the prime advantage of this measure of dispersion of the range is that it's easy to understand and it's very easy to calculate. However, it comes with a few disadvantages. So let's consider this sample data sets. So for the first data set, we have 71, 75, 79, 86, 90, 94, 96, 98. So let's just imagine these are test scores, for example. And the second data set, we have 71, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, and 98. All right, so take time to observe the values. But to better visualize our data, let's try to plot them on a one-dimensional axis. So we'll use blue triangles for the first data set and red circles for the second data set. So here is the one-dimensional axis and the data points. So both data sets have the same range, 27, since they have the same minimum, which is 71, and maximum value, which is 98. But you'll see from the visualization that the measurements in the second data, I mean, in the second data set are closer to each other and the first are more spread out. So if you noticed, one disadvantage of the range is that it's sensitive to outliers. So it's sensitive to outliers. Uh, in the case of the second set, we have 71 and 98 as uh, the outliers. And another disadvantage of the range is that it relies on two extreme observations and does not consider the rest of the data points. That means it conveys no information or not much information about the spread of observations about the mean. So one approach we can use to include all of our data points instead of just two is to calculate how far each of our data points are from the mean. We call this the deviation, which is the positive or negative distance from the mean. But if we add all the deviations from the mean with their respective positive or negative signs, we will always obtain a total of zero because the negative deviations will exactly cancel out the positive deviation. Consider this example. Um, our data set contains four values. We have 8, 14, 11, and 7. So the mean of these values is 10. So calculating the deviations from the mean, we get uh, 8 minus 10, that's equal to negative 2. 14 minus 10, that's equal to, to positive 4. 11 minus 10, 1. 7 minus 10, we have negative 3. So if we add all these 4, negative 2 plus 4 plus 1 plus negative 3, we get a total of 0. So it would be useless to get the total deviation if our total would just be zero. Instead, what we can do is we can add the absolute values of the deviations. So 8 minus 10 would be positive 2 and then 7 minus 10 would be positive 3. So if we add all these four, so 2 plus 4 plus 1 plus 3, we get a total deviation of 10. So let's try to compare this to another data set. So in our second data set, we have the values 9, 12, 10, and another 9. So getting the absolute value of the deviations, we have 1, 2, 0, and 1 for a total deviation of 4. So as we can see, the first data set has a higher total deviation. So that means it has greater variation than the second data set. This seems like a better way of describing variation than range. I mean, you get an idea of the spread of the data points, right? Um, this seems like a working solution. All is happy, except we're still not. So why is that? So some problems with total deviation is that first, 
uh, as we increase the number of our observations, the value of the total deviation also increases. So if we have a fairly large data set, it will have a high total deviation, even if the data points are close to each other, because since we're considering all the deviations from the mean, the total deviation just keeps increasing. So this means that if we're comparing two data sets that have different numbers of observations, the total deviation may not be a useful tool to use. It would be better if our measure of variation were independent of the population or sample size so we can compare data sets that have different numbers of observations. So the alternative approach is to take the mean deviation. The mean deviation is the mean difference of each item in the distribution from the center or from the mean. In formula form, that is the sum of all the deviations from the mean, so absolute, val uh, absolute value of x minus x bar, uh, get the sum of that, divided by the number of observations, n. So to illustrate, let's try uh, using the data set from our problem on matchsticks earlier. Okay, so for brand A, we have, uh, on average, we have 48 sticks. So that's our mean, that's our x bar. So 48 minus 40, uh, 48, which is our observation, minus the average 48, we get 0, and then 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1. So we get the total of these deviations so in, and divide it by the number of observations, which is 6. So it, it will look something like this. So the mean deviation for brand A is 0 0.67. So for brand B, um, these are the deviations. So it's 36, 14, 45, 2, 45, 20. And we got this by subtracting the mean of the mean or the average which is 48 from our observations so in formula form when you when when we add all the deviations we get uh, and when we add all the deviations and divided by the number of samples we get a mean deviation of 27. so the advantage of the mean deviation obviously is that it's simple it's easy to understand how we arrived at this formula, and it's not dependent on the sample size. However, we'll see that the mean deviation is not commonly used in statistics, primarily because it does not describe a parameter in the population. Desire isn't bad. It's your window to the future. Go where your heart beats. Moving on, as I mentioned, if we add the deviations with their corresponding signs, we'll just get a total of zero. That's why we're taking the absolute values instead for total deviation and mean deviation. But another method of eliminating the negative signs is to square the deviations and get the mean. So this is basically the concept of the variance. And we have two types, uh, the population variance and the sample variance. So first, the population variance is calculated by adding all the squared deviations from the population mean and dividing it by the total number of items in the population. The population variance is denote denoted by the lowercase Greek letter sigma with a square. So it's sigma squared. So the population variance is a parameter meaning it's a property of, of the population, whereas the sample variance is a statistic and is a property of the sample. So the formula for sample variance is essentially the same as the population variance, except that instead of mu, which is the population mean again, we'll change this to sample mean x bar. And another difference is that instead of the big letter n, which denotes the number of observations in the population, we'll change this to the small letter n minus 1. So it's n minus 1. So to get the sample variance, we need to add all the square deviations from the sample mean and divide it by 1 less than the number of items in the sample. It's easy to understand how we der derive the formulas for the earlier measures but the concept of variance is slightly more confusing because of two important modifications. First uh, is the numerator, which we call the sum of the squares of the deviations from the, from the mean, or in short, the sum of the squares. And the second one is particular to sample variance, which is the n minus 1, or what we call the degrees of freedom. Let's talk about the square deviations first. 
every time someone asks about the square or why we're squaring the deviations, mostly what they tell you is that it eliminates the signs of the deviations from the mean. However, we already solved that problem by taking the absolute value of the deviations. So another reason why we're squaring the deviations is that it helps us drive an important statistic, which is a standard deviation, which we'll talk about in a few. Because we're squaring the deviations, our units are also squared. This means that um, the variance does not have the same unit as our data points. So it's difficult to visualize the dispersion of our data set if we report it in terms of variance. For example, if you see a value that says 1.50 meters plus or minus um, 3.22 meters squared, you're, you're bound to wonder what, what that meter squared value mean. Instead, what we use when we're reporting our data is the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance. And since it's the square root, the standard deviation has the same unit as the original measurements. But if we were going to get the square root after all, why is there even a need to square the deviations in the first place? I mean, we can just stick to the mean deviation and make our lives easier, right? So um, technically that's correct, but in more advanced statistical tests, you'll see that squaring the deviations has better computational and inferential properties compared to just taking the absolute value. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Uh, instead, let's move on to why we're dividing by n minus one instead of just n. So the explanation for this is mathematically complex, but the simple answer is that Using n minus 1 instead of just n corrects the bias in the estimation of the population variance. So it gives an unbiased estimate of the population variance. If you're happy with that explanation, you have my full permission to skip the video forward. But if you're still not convinced, let me try my best to explain this without resorting to complex mathematical proofs. So let's start with the premise that the population mean mu and the population variance sigma squared are parameters. Uh, meaning they are properties of the population, whereas the sample mean x bar and the sample variance s squared are statistics or properties of a sample. The values of population parameters, or in this case, the mu and the sigma squared, are often unknown. So instead, we do our best to estimate them. And um, the sample mean x bar estimates or best estimates the population mean mu and the sample variance best estimates the population variance. So when we're calculating the variance or the variance, we uh, we can replace the true mean or the or the population mean by our best estimate, which is the sample mean x bar. But they found out mathematically that subtracting the sample mean or sub subtracting sample mean makes the variance as small as possible, thereby underestimating the true value of the population variance. So to compensate for that, they found out that dividing by n minus 1 instead of just n makes the sample variance a little bigger. And turns out this uh, dividing by n minus 1 properly compensates for the problem. And uh, the sample variance uh, is equal to the population variance on average when we're using n minus 1 as our divisor. So another perspective on why we're using n minus 1 as our divisor is related to the concept of the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom is defined as the number of values used in the calculation that are free to vary. So we can understand that. Let's try to illustrate, illustrate that using this example. So suppose we draw four independent observations from a population where mu or the population mean is equal to 10. So the first value we draw can be anything. So let's say it's 11. So we can calculate the deviation by subtracting, subtracting the population mean from this number. So it's 11 minus 10 is equal to negative 1. I mean positive 1. 11 minus 10 is equal to 1. The next value we draw can also be anything. So let's say it's 5. So 5 minus 10 is equal to negative 5. That's a deviation. And then our third observation can also be anything. So we get a deviation of neg negative 3. Now, for our fourth value, since we're drawing from a population, it can also be any number. So in this case, we'll just denote it as a question mark. But 
uh, because we're again we're drawing from a population, it can be any number. So that means in this calculation, um, our degrees of freedom is equal to four because all four values or all four independent observations can be any value. Now, let's say we draw four independent observations from a sample. Uh, I'm sorry, that should be sample, not population. Our population mean is unknown in this, scenario, in this case, but from our four independent observations, we calculated that our sample mean is equal to 8. We'll use this x bar to, or sample mean to estimate our population mean. So our first value can be any number or can have any value. So let's just say it's 11. And... Now, we can calculate uh, the deviation by um, subtracting, subtracting the, the sample mean from this value. So 11 minus 8 is equal to 3. Our second value can also be anything. or can also be any value. And let's say it's 5. So 5 minus 8, again, that's the sample mean. We get uh, a deviation of negative 3. And then for our third observation, it can also be anything. Let's just say it's 7. So 7 minus 8 is equal to negative 1. But on our last observation, things are a little different. So once we know the sample mean, which in this case it's 8, we know and we know the first three the first three observations, we know what the last observation must be. So if the mean of the sample is 8, and the first observ first three observations are 11, 5, and 7 then the fourth observation must be 9. And we know that the fourth deviation must be 1 because, again, when we total the deviations, it must be equal to, or it must add up to 0. So 3 plus negative 3 plus negative 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. So this means that our last observation isn't free to vary anymore. We can already calculate its value from the sample mean and from the first three observations. So in this calculation, we only have three degrees of freedom because the last observation is not free to vary. Again, we can already calculate it once we know the sample mean and we know the first three observations or one less than the number of independent observations. So let's try to find the variance of brand A from our earlier example. Again, we, you need to get the deviation and then this time you need to square it. So 48 minus 48 is 0 squared. It's 2, 1 squared, 1, 1, 1, 1. And when you get the total of that, you get, when you add all, the, all these numbers, you get a total of 4. So that means our total or the sum of our squares is 4 and our n is 6. So n minus 1 is equal to 5 uh, in this case. So S squared is equal to 4 over 5. So that means our sample variance is 0 0.8. Uh, however, again, as I mentioned, we don't usually report our data using the variance. Instead, we, we take the square root of the variance to get the same uh, unit of measurements as our original data. So the square root of the variance is called the standard deviation. And again, we have two. So the square root of the population variance is called the population standard deviation. And the square root of the sample variance is the standard or the sample standard deviation. So just to help you remember the symbols, again, sigma squared is the population variance, while as sigma is the population standard deviation. And then S squared is the sample variance, and S is the sample standard deviation. Sam sample standard deviation is uh, also commonly reported as SD. So st um, it stands for standard deviation, of course. Some remarks about the standard deviation is that it can't be calculated from the mean of unsquared numbers. So we really have to square the deviations when we're getting um, the variance and then the standard deviation. Uh, another thing is that the standard deviation and also the variance depends on large differences from the mean being given more importance than small differences. So unlike the mean deviation, we treat um, distances from the mean equally uh, but for standard deviation, since we're squaring the deviations, uh, data points that are farther from the mean will have a higher distance. Or will yes, will have a higher distance. 
So let's try taking the standard deviation of brand B from, again, our earlier example. So I have already calculated the square deviations here. So we have, for the first sample, 1,296, and then 196, 2,225, 4, 2025, and then 400. So we got this by subtracting the average, which is 48, from these observations in the second column. So totaling all the square deviations, we get a sum of 5,146. And our formula, again, we uh, on our numerator, we have uh, the total or the sum of the square deviations, which is, again, 5,146. We divide that by 1 less than the number of observations. So that's 5. And then getting the square root of that, we get a standard deviation of um, 34. Graphically, we can present standard deviation as a line passing through our data points. So this graph shows the average number of matches in each in each brand, so brand A and brand B, with their corresponding standard deviation. So a, a shorter a shorter line will mean that it has a um, less it has less deviation, and a longer line will mean that it has more deviation or higher standard deviation. So going back to our calculation for brand B, standard deviation can be reported alongside your average. So since our, the average number of matchsticks in brand B is 48, we can present our data as 48 plus or minus 34 matches per box. So if we add 34 to 48, we get 82. And if we subtract 34 from, from 48, we get 14. So this suggests that uh, the number of matches in each box varies between 14 and 82 matches. However, if we go back to our data, only three of the six lie within this range. So that is um, the second box, which is 60, 62, and then we have 50 and 68. But really, it should be four. And why is that? So that's the concept of the standard deviation worth scale. So imagine a scale that looks like this where the mean of your data is at the center and to the right of this mean are the positive standard deviation worths and to the left are the negative standard deviation worths. So this scale expresses how many standard deviations a particular data point is away from the mean. So the farther a data point is away from the mean, the less likely we would expect it, the less likely we would expect it to encounter the data point in our sampling. So if you have a one standard deviation worth above the mean or below the mean, so that's positive or negative one standard deviation worths, you'll know that 68% of the observations will lie between that interval. And then 95% of the observations will lie between the mean positive or negative two standard deviation worths. The last measure of dispersion we have for this lecture is the coefficient of variation. There are times when it's useful to describe the variation by expressing the standard deviation as um, proportion or percentage of the mean, which we call the coefficient of variation. We calculate the coefficient of variation, or CV, by dividing the standard deviation by the mean and multiplying by 100%. Since this is a dimensionless quantity that does not depend on the magnitude of the measurements, it helps in comparing populations or samples having different means and different standard deviations. For example, let's say we want to compare the variability of the lengths of elephant ears versus mouse ears. Uh, and we obtain these data. Uh, I took the liberty of calculating the mean and standard deviation, but if you want to recheck to familiar familiarize yourselves with the formulas, feel free to do so. Uh, if we compare the standard deviations of the elephant ears and the mouse ears as they are, we can see that elephant ears ha have a higher standard deviation. But that doesn't necessarily mean it has a greater variation than mouse ears. So that's why we instead calculate for the coefficient of variation. So to get that, we just divide the standard deviation by the mean and again multiply it by 100%. So the coefficient of variation of the elephant ears is... 16.7% um, and the mouse ears is 20%. So as we can see, the mouse ears actually have a higher variation than elephant ears. 
that's the last measure of dispersion we will discuss in this lecture. Just to summarize, again, the five measures of dispersion we discussed in this lecture are the range, the mean deviation, but we also talked about the total deviation. We have the variance, so we have two, the population and the sample variance. We have the standard deviation, we also have two, the population standard deviation and the, the sample standard deviation. And lastly, we have the coefficient of, var coefficient of variation. If you want to review and practice solving measures of dispersion, I have included here a sample problem. Uh, pause the video if you want to solve it first, or you can screen cap the question and just uh, answer it whenever you are available. So that's all for this lecture. I hope you were able to follow along, and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. See you in the next one. Thank you.